Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. Over the past 12 weeks, we've been bringing you a very important series titled Confronting Hate, Humanity's Greatest Challenge. On today's program and next week, we have a, a very, very prominent guest to finish this series to get us through 14 weeks of something that is of great importance to every human being. I welcome to the program Mr. Brent Scarpo. He comes to us from Southern California and his credentials are extremely impressive. Uh, he is the founder of the New Light Media and through his work he has been a casting director for six years, uh, casting mostly pictures, television projects, commercials, and he certainly has worked on some very, very important films that you'd be aware of, such as Air Force One and That Thing You Do. He also did a special for ABC, uh, Christmas Miracles. But he's here today and next week to discuss uh, a film that will historically uh, contribute greatly to our uh, attack upon hate, and it's called Journey to a Hate-Free Millennium. Uh, this film has won numerous awards, uh, as it should have. It is an inspiring documentary addressing the subject of hate, by searching out the origins of how it is taught and learned, the scope of its danger beginning with childhood taunting all the way through to murder. Uh, he will tell us the content of that film as uh, well with other things. I also want to say about our guest that uh, he has traveled widely and he has um, presented in 47 states, uh, 10 countries, and in addition to that he has been to, uh, as of the taping of this program, my understanding 141 high schools, 12 middle schools, 186 colleges and universities, and other educational groups and conferences, 58. Over 100,000 people have heard his message, and we're bringing that message to you today and next week. Uh, I wish that I had more time to, with your impressive credentials, but if I may call you, Brent, welcome to the program. Please, thank you so much for having me. It's a delight to have you here, and I'm very pleased to have panelists, uh, Erna Reinhardt, the Director of Public Relations at North Dakota College, and she'll start the question with our guest today. Welcome, Brent. Thank you. This is, a, this is an honor for us. Tell us a little bit about, give us an overview about your film and tell us what inspired you to make this. Sure. Journey to a Hate-Free Millennium was uh, really conceived between myself and one other producer and director, Martin Bedonier. Um, prior to the new millennium, I found there was so much negativity in the world. Like, you know, you look at a magazine cover and it was Y2K, God's mad, the world's going to blow up. And I thought to myself, why all the negativity? You know. I mean, this millennium is probably going to be, for most of us, the only one we're going to see. Uh, so why can't we take the lessons from the past millennium and utilize them in a way to really make this the greatest millennium of our lives? So we started to research why. And we started looking at the social issues of the day. And we kept a list. Well, we got up to over 400. You know, whether it be battered women, violence against homosexuals, violence against race, violence against religion. And for whatever reason, as I was writing all those down, all of a sudden the word hate just appeared. And it came to me. The reason why all these disenfranchised organizations come together is because it's one person or one group hitting another person or another group. They all have come together because their foundation is hate. They are hated. So I realized at that moment in time, it's not that we need to talk about these individualist groups. It's that we need to talk about why they have come together, what is common about them, and it's hate. So I said, I'm going to create a film that deals with the issue of hate and how we can get people to come together and dialogue about the issue. And if we can dialogue about it, then we can come up with questions and then hopefully the answers. Excellent. Now your film deals with three specific incidents. Tell us about that. Sure. Um, you know, New Light Media is a nonprofit organization and we're a very, I will say, odd organization. Um, we didn't look for the stories. We wrote a treatment saying we wanted three stories to be part of the documentary. We asked the stories to find us. We didn't look for them. I didn't watch TV, I didn't look at magazines, none of that. However it came, is how it happened. The first story was uh, overheard by the other producer uh, at a coffee shop about an African-American man that was dragged to his death in Jasper, Texas. That was James Byrd Jr. Shortly after that, we all heard about Matthew Shepard, the gay student that was murdered in Laramie, Wyoming. Um, we have two stories now. Now, the prerequisite for these stories were that the families had to give us the rights and they had to be part of the solution. We wanted them to be on board with us. And if they didn't do it, then we wouldn't take the story. Um, I moved to Denver. In March of 99, uh, we're working on the two stories, because uh, both trials were going on in those two tragedies. Uh, I wanted how many stories? Three. Six weeks later, ten minutes from my new backyard in Denver, is a high school called Columbine. The third story found us. So our three stories, as we look at the subject of hate, 
are Columbine High School, specifically Rachel Scott, Matthew Shepard, and James Byrd Jr. Excellent. I don't know uh, where I, I think it was you that I talked to. It was a year and a half, or maybe almost two years ago, that I talked to uh, some of your, uh, one of you in Denver, Colorado, and we wanted to have you here. And, it just didn't work out at the time. That was me. And that, I, I didn't know if you would remember or not. I, 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 I had the conversation with you. <laughs> and so at this point, before I ask you my questions, I must think uh, two groups that made this happen. The University of Idaho Office of Diversity and Human Rights, which received a grant from the Greg C. Carr Foundation, who's so generous to us in Idaho and human rights from Massachusetts, a native of Idaho. And this whole process is in honor of a great civil rights activist who died last year, uh, the Bill Wasmuth Lecture Series for the next five years. So with that, it's good to talk to you again. Absolutely. I, I didn't know where you would remember our conversation. I absolutely, I remember every word. Oh, that's <laughs> wonderful. You're a great guy. With that, I, the, the film is just very powerful, and, and you're here today with us at, at North Idaho College, and you'll be at the University of Idaho and other places. In the film itself, and you have a shortened version, uh, in addition to we hearing the message of hate and, and here are the consequences of hate, you also, at the end of the film, work with the audience. And, and I guess what I'm so impressed about is someone who's president of a human rights organization and someone who's worked in this for 25 years is, and university, uh, Gonzaga University has an Institute for Action Against Hate. It's just a remarkable in-depth study they're doing. Um, I want to pick your brain because you truly are an expert and, you're, and you're, you're not only intellectually involved in this, but your heart's involved. So with that long introduction, for our wonderful viewers, describe what hate is. Um, you know, it's interesting. I ask that question of college students, middle school, and high school students, and I get myriads of answers. It's amazing. Um, I think one of the, and I've heard it many times before, but one student literally in front of 800 college students said, well, that's simple. Hate's an absence of love. That's a good answer. You know, that's and right. I thought, of all the answers I've heard, it can be a little long-winded and so on and so on. I'm like, how simple is it? You know, because it really is simple. I mean, if you look at the subject of hate, I think what's happened is we've sort of exacerbated it so much so. And there are different little key things that I've, I've discovered that a lot of people haven't discovered. I think that's added to why we hate so much now. Um, but when that particular student said that, I said, you're absolutely correct. You know, and why is there an absence of love? And we started getting into that conversation and we discovered it's so much easier to hate than it is to love. It's so much easier to go up to somebody and slap them around or tear them apart or pull their personality you know, uh, off them and, and stomp on it than it is to go up to somebody and say those three words, I love you. Those are hard. There's more commitment. There. Absolutely. And what's interesting is that, what's interesting, what we discussed at this one particular school is that the I love you and all that, that's what we really want. But that's what takes so much uh, energy and so much, so much of our own soul. So because that's so difficult and we don't think we deserve it on a lot of levels, we do this instead. It's so much easier to hate and to tear another person down. Two or three more parts to my question. <laughs> <laughs> I, Erna is very patient with me. Also, that, that's very powerful what you said, but also in our work and, and some people who have been in hate groups and have fortunately come out of them and, and, and gone through, I call it a, a um, conversion to civil rights, tell us that what made them a, a subject for the hate groups was the lack of self-esteem or uh, a good feeling or l those groups giving them a chance to find a scapegoat. So how, how does that fit into the process? Sure, I'll give you a perfect example. In our documentary, Journey to a Hate-Free Millennium, we had those three stories. Well, when you make a documentary, you really kind of just, you know, you write out your treatment and then you burn it. Because if you don't, you never know what miracle is going to show up. Well, the miracle that showed up in my documentary is a gentleman by the name of T.J. Lydon, who actually lived in Idaho for many years. We've had him in Spokane. I know him. He's pretty amazing. He's in my documentary. Yes, right. Yes. T.J., uh, um, without giving a lot of it away, but was in the Aryan Nation group for almost 16, 17 years and, uh, and had a bit of a transformation. Um, and I spent, I've spent almost two years now with him, we've done lectures together, and there was a point in time that I said to him, you know, how, how did you change, or what happened, you know, and it's in my film. He talks about how one day his three-year-old son just got off the couch, um, turned off the TV, turned around, pointed his finger at his daddy and said, Daddy, you know we're not supposed to watch shows with niggers on it. And for whatever reason, after 17 years, with his mother saying, TJ, you've got to stop, his, his brother, who's a police officer, all his family members saying, you've got to stop this behavior. What I love is that it took his three-year-old child for him to see the light or to see an aspect of it. 
And it was that process thereafter. And that's why I say that wonderful organizations such as yourselves and all those who brought me here, what we do is we plant seeds. We're gardeners. For 17 years, they planted seeds in T.J. Lydon's heart right. and in his mind. And what was nice is that it was his three-year-old son that allowed the blossom to bloom. And we cannot give up on that. You know, it's important. And when I met with TJ, I said, how did you get it? I mean, he's such a nice guy. He's got five kids. He's such a, I mean, to see what he was prior to that was just, you know, black and white. And his story is pretty amazing. And I think it's representative of everybody who makes that transition. He said when he was 16 or 17 years old, his parents were having a brutal divorce, you know, and they would fight. He would leave the house and he would end up on a playground, you know, and hanging out. And this one particular time, uh, there was these gentlemen that came up to him. And, you know, it's interesting the recruitment methods that a lot of people in these particular groups that foster hate use. And you would think that they're, you know, hateful themselves, and they're not. He said, what's wrong? And he said, my parents getting a divorce. They don't care. And they just basically said, you know what? We have an organization that does care. We have an organization that uh, actually is looking to do some good in this world. In fact, you know what? Everybody in our organization looks just like you. And what is TJ and every other person that gets kind of sucked into that vacuum looking for? Well, as TJ said to me, he said, my parents were having a divorce and they forgot one thing. They forgot they had children. And so he was looking for what? Love. That's why with that quote, absolutely. When the woman at the college said, what is hate? It's an absence of love. What did the Aryan nation see in TJ and that playground? An absence of love. And so what they did is they recreated the definition to fit their particular model, put that into TJ, and all of a sudden TJ felt what? What we all want to feel, loved and accepted. That's a very powerful answer. Arna Reinhardt. This, this movie has taken you on a journey, and you have been to many, many places. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Um, you know, it's interesting. When I got the rights to these stories, I promised the families that if I got the rights, I would educate the world. Meanwhile, I had no idea how I was going to do that. Um, but I thought to myself, you know what? Just let the spirit move you and it'll just show itself. And uh, literally, you know, I was born to do this work. And um, I was able to get agents and people to help me. And I started speaking at colleges and universities. And then we got some grants to help uh, me get into high schools and middle schools. Um, we do this program all the way down to seventh grade. Uh, I think it's important. And in fact, New Light Media is in the process of putting a K through six program together as well. Because uh, hate is taught. It's taught all the way down to kindergartners. I mean, it's just amazing. We've got first graders killing each other, you know, because of hateful behaviors and hateful words. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, what's nice is I've been able to fulfill that promise. So I've been to every U.S. state. Uh, this will be my first time in Idaho. I'm so excited. Um, I have three so states. I just, I, this is just like such a, uh, there was a time where I, I was looking at the United States map and we put pins where I'd been and all of a sudden I'm like, I have 10 states left. And uh, now we're down to three. Um, you know, the strangest call was when, uh, or not call, I got an email uh, from somebody from Budapest, Hungary. And it was like, we want your film Budapest. The rest I couldn't quite understand, you know, and we'll fly you out here. That I understood. Um, you know, and I emailed them and I said, is this, a, you know, how'd you find out about this? And they had found out about it. And yes, I flew to Budapest. I was there for two weeks. And you know, there was an interesting lesson I learned when I went there. And I think we're starting to feel that now at this point in time in history is that when I left Budapest, I realized that hate is international. Hate can be, can, can be translated into every known language. As well as love. Yeah, mm. absolutely. And it depends on what it is that you're going to, uh, what are you going to profess? Mm -hmm. And that's what they did. They brought me in there and go, look, this is what we're trying to achieve, but this is what we have. Mm. Tell us about how your film has impacted people, because I'm sure that you've oh. got some wonderful stories. Yeah, it it's, uh, it, you know, I didn't really know what was going to happen. And I think, uh, I can tell you what, you know, we have an educational kit now because I just can't get everywhere. The first two years I didn't sell the, the documentary at all because I wanted to be a responsible educator. We put an educational guide together. I had 12 amazing teachers, professors, human rights people, even a feng shui master put this educational guide together. So now anybody can actually take this film and present this in their class and, and, and that's important. In the process, in the first two years, I started asking wonderful people such as yourself when I went to present the program, what do you need? What are you, what's working for you? What's not working for you? And so I met college students and high school students. And there's a few things that happened in the first week. I remember the first program I did, I had a sophomore student, a male, come up to me afterwards, tears streaming down his face, streaming. And this was four years ago. And I, I spoke volumes, especially about our young people. He said, I'm so glad you came here today. I said, me too. I said, are you okay? He said, yeah. I said, um, he said, you just don't understand something. I said, what's that? He said, you're the first person in my life 
that's allowed me to talk about my world. Mm. And he was a sophomore in college. And I was the first person that stayed quiet enough to listen and to allow him to talk about his world. I share with you that the young people in our world are starving to death. They are starving to death because we as adults, as parents, as ministers, as government agencies, as whatever, are so busy trying to input information that we're not quieting ourselves down enough to listen to what their pains are. That's why Columbine happened. If they just would have stayed quiet for a brief moment of time, and I'm not blaming teach, it, it takes a society to raise a village and a child. Mm -hmm. If they would have stayed quiet for a moment, every one of our young people are screaming at us what it is that they need. We just need to listen. You are really getting to the heart of it. This is going to be a great way to end this 14-week series with these two programs. Uh, I'm going to go back to the first uh, speaker we had, uh, Father uh, Robert Spitzer, the president of Gonzaga University. He gave a very powerful opening speech. And he did something I never heard before. And I'm going to tell you the three steps and then get your reaction. And in speaking of hate, he says, hate commences internally with the individual, which you've, uh, you've been talking about today. And then there's a need for that person who hates to share that with the level two, which is their interpersonal circle. And they try to convince those in their circle to hate also, which makes it an inclusive group. And then from that, excuse me, it's four, uh, four steps. Then the third step is it becomes communal if the community will accept it. And so out of that hate group comes a, a larger community to hate. And then finally, he said step four is that it gets in the culture. And if it gets in the culture, it may take centuries to, to correct it. That was, I thought, a powerful message. I want to get your reaction to his theory and his process. Sure. I agree in a lot of ways. When I talk to uh, college students and high school students, I always say, you have two stones and you can throw one of them into the pond. What kind of ripples are you going to create? One stone is truly about love and one stone is truly about hate. And you need to look at your language, you need to look at your words, you need to look at your behavior. Because the end of our documentary, our tagline is the journey begins with me. Not with you and not with us. If I say with you and I point my finger at you, you're going to look at me and say, get your finger out of my face. Mm -hmm. If I say with us, you're going to say, you know what, I'm just going to go away. I'm, I'm going to go get some McDonald's. You, you all just deal with hate. But if I say the journey begins with me, then I've got to take a very introspective look at my own life and see where it is that I lie when it comes to this particular subject. And what stone am I going to throw in the pond? Because he's absolutely correct. There are ripple effects that occur. Now what I would add to that is this, and I say this again when I speak, and it to look at the students' faces, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty amazing because here's my belief system. When it comes to the subject of hate, what it, if you boil it all down, you extrapolate it down to its lowest common dom denominator, this is what it is, my opinion. What is it that I love so little about myself that I feel a need to perpetrate a crime against somebody else or myself? Why do college students abuse sex, alcohol, drugs, date rape, all that? It's all self-hate. It's all self-hate. And so I would say that to this particular gentleman's theory, absolutely. What happens was, well, because I can't love myself, I'm not going to model that behavior. So I can hate myself, so I'm going to model that behavior. I'm going to get as many people as I can to model what it is that I feel about myself so that I have other people that feel good, that, that allow me to feel good, even though this is not a good feeling. So it begins here, and then you create those ripples. And because of that, that group becomes your support system. Absolutely. And if they will hate too, you feel more secure. Right, in because here's the deal, and we're doing this K-6 through program, right? I'm walking down this elementary school doing some research. I saw two little second graders. One little second grader says, you're so gay. The other little second grader says, no, you're so gay. The other second grader says, no, you're so gay. Now, what was interesting about that is two things. A, the uh, principal I was with never said a word, mm -hmm. and I had to stop her and say, I think you need to deal with that. And she becomes so used to that rhetoric that all of a sudden, it became second nature second. to her. The yeah. second thing I realized is that those two students had no idea what they were saying. Yeah. But here's what they knew, that whatever society taught them about that word, this gives me power over you and makes me feel good about me. And, 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 and this word, whatever it means, is something negative about Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me give you another example. And, and we are in the process of working on some plants with the college. We've had a, we have some great policies dealing with um, human rights and diversity, but then we need plans to put in place. The University of Idaho has come up with a remarkable 24-page plan that I'm very impressed with. But I want to give you an example and then get your reaction to it. At our own campus, this happened about two months ago, and, and well-meaning people need to be empowered to deal with the question. In a class uh, that one of our uh, faculty members was teaching, an older student in the class said a very, very homophobic statement. 
the teacher, who's a wonderful person, not knowing how to deal with it, she changed the subject. A young man in the class who is gay came to me and said, at that moment I became isolated. I had no support. There was no response. And his first reaction was, she did not care. But perceptions are very dangerous. She did care. But she was so embarrassed and so felt inadequate that she didn't know how to deal with it. So my question is, like through your film and your other works and all, how can we help really good people deal with those situations to be what I call an ally for someone who is facing sure. that kind of derogatory comment? Great question. Um, you know, it's interesting. When I speak, I give every student my personal email address. I have probably 100,000 emails over the last four years of everything from seventh grade all the way up to college students. And I would say if there's a predominant theme, uh, it would be, can you talk to my parents? Yeah. Uh, they get it. But what's so difficult is that they're getting these mixed messages from their parents and they're having this very uh, interesting struggle depending on whether they're in middle school, high school, or college going, I love my mom and dad, but I'm being taught this and they're not, their actions aren't modeling that. So what do I do? And I get that all the time. You know, the little girl who, a uh, college student will email me saying, I loved your program, but my father still uses the N word. What do I do? And I think there are five words we need to look at and we'll probably do this uh, today on stage, um, we say that ignorance leads to fear, fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. And if we can understand that cycle, and if we can understand those words and what those words mean to each and every one of us, we can better ourselves so it doesn't get to hate. This particular teacher, and you said it wisely, was just ignorant. And ignorant, I will tell you that I am the most ignorant person in this room right now, and I'm very proud of it. I love being ignorant. Ignorant to me is a lack of knowledge. And I am so grateful for the fact that I am ignorant. Why? It allows me the courage to become more knowledgeable. Can you imagine if we were not? We wouldn't have jobs. There would be no reason for colleges and universities and high schools and middle schools. Ignorance is why education thrives. It allows us the courage the, and the ability, which is what we need to really share with this one particular teacher. Look, yeah, you had, because she was looking at her own hate and she was looking at her own ignorance, her own fears. And all of a sudden she looked at them, she got so you know, perplexed by them, she went, okay, next subject for $100. Uh, you know, and that's the good news is that she looked at them. You know, she saw it. Now, what we need to do is get her to the next step. Okay, now what is it? What, what can we give you? What can we teach you? What simple thing that we can do that all of a sudden at that very moment in time, because what's what I call a teacher moment? Exactly. That's Ooh, oh, that's powerful. That could have just, you know, but, but it's interesting. It still was a teacher moment because that one student came to you, and now you can actually go to that teacher and go, look, this all happened to me. It's when people drop the ball. You know, it's interesting. The ripple effects, there can be ripples of hate, there can be ripples of love, and there can be ripples of learning. You know, it, it ended up, you know. So my question would be, what did you do with it? Oh, I, 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 I'm glad you, uh, see, I'm supposed to ask the questions, but I'm so glad you did. <laughs> to me, I love it when that happens. I tell you exactly what I did. The first thing, I spent a lot of time with that student. Good. And I told that student uh, what a remarkable person he was and that he was not the one with the problem. And then I took it to a committee, I'm on a steering committee, and we are going to work on a whole year's plan, like the University Fighters Plan, in which we're going to offer, in a very generous way, a training for those, so those situations right. can be correct. May I just share one other thing, because this conversation is so much fun. And I've been so lucky we had uh, the CEO of, of um, Safeco Insurance on this program in this series, and I said to him, I think it's one of the best programs in my 31 years, uh, in the top 10, and I'm putting you in the top 10. Well, thank you. So this has been a great, great exciting time for me to, to try to get this message out of what it's all about. But I had a class in which I teach political science, and so a wonderful woman in the class, she said one day in class, uh, all men are created equal. And I thought to myself, this is a great teaching moment. And I said, excuse me, you have a right under free speech to say what you want to in this class but I have to, uh, an obligation to the whole class, and did you not mean all individuals? And her response to me was, I'm tired of political correctness. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, I tell you, this is a teaching moment. And so we had like a 20 minute dialogue how why words are so powerful. And even though she could choose that word, I tried to teach that if you use certain words, like the little kids were using the word gay in a negative way. Right. Words are so powerful, if you use them in a certain way, you're going to wind up it, demeaning other individuals, de attacking their self-esteem. And after a while, those words are so powerful, people believe about themselves. A wonderful woman in this campus and I were having a little dialogue and once she got a little frustrated and she said to me, what do I know, I'm just a woman. My time out. I said, you have to promise me that never again in this lifetime, 
whether you're winning or losing on a point that you will ever do that to yourself again. So that's how I deal with it. That was wonderful. I don't know. Well, I just want to follow up with that. You said that words are so powerful, and the flip side of that is that silence is so powerful as well. And I think that was the example that you were, you were talking about with the teacher that didn't quite know how to react, so in that scenario didn't do anything. Um, it sounds as though, Brent, what you also have are some techniques and some strategies that enable people to know how to react in those kinds of situations. Can you share some of those things with us or sure. tell us about your training that you have? Um, it's interesting. Uh, the educational guide, uh, we finally put this together. It's about 25 pages and basically we have four sections. How to present the film at middle schools, high schools, colleges and universities and um, colleges, universities and communities. And we basically, and it's simple. What I didn't want when I was putting this guide together, I said if anyone comes back to me with a three ring binder that's about 100 pages long that's got dust on it, I'm going to be very frustrated because no one's going to go through it. I want simple exercises. What do you do before the film? What do you do during and what do you do after? The film brings you to an emotional state to where if the facilitator creates a safe place, all of a sudden you're going to hear everything that as a teacher you've wanted to hear. You know, I, I, I get these things all the time. Um, I'll give you an example of, of things that I've done. Um, and we talk about the concept of are you part of the solution or are you part of the problem, right? I'll give you an example. And this happened in my own life. I was, um, when I go to a different city, if I have time, I go to the mall. I just hang out or go to a, you know art museum or whatever. And my sister and I were at the <coughs> mall and I was at the Skechers store buying shoes. And there were two young ladies uh, that were salespeople on the ladders. And if you've ever been to a Skechers store, they're huge and they're shoes. And all of a sudden the one girl screamed to the other girl at the very end of the store, girl, you're so gay. And then the other girl, she screams. And there's like 12, 30, 40 people in, in this place. Girl, you're so gay. And then she goes, no, girl, you're so gay. And by the time we got to the third one, I was tying my shoe and I said to myself mentally, if she says it one more time, I have to say something. Well, she said it and all of a sudden I got up and my assistant goes, uh-oh. <laughs> you know? Now, my heart was beating on my chest just as hard as anybody else's and I do this for a living, right? And I walked over to her and with my palms open and very, you know, uh, uh, very unassertive and I just saw this little 17 I said could you come here for a second and she came down I said I said look um there's a lot of people in the store and I was getting my shoes over here Five sure and uh, <laughs> I said um you were yelling this and what inevitably happened is that she uh, ended up going to the manager I ended up talking to her and she apologized on that note I turn the permit conclusion oh. good news that we'll be back next week until <laughs> then please have a good week I am Tony Stewart Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest-running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station. Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart in welcoming today's guest. On today's program, we're going to bring to a close a 14-week series, in fact, the most in-depth series in the 31-year history of this program, dealing with the subject confronting hate, humanity's greatest challenge. Last week we were so energized by our guest who has some powerful messages to give about how we move from hate to, to love. Our guest is Brent Scarpo. Uh, our guest is a, a really, really gifted human being. He is the founder of the New Light Media. Uh, he has been a casting director, uh, casting motion pictures, television projects, commercials, and many other activities including such films as Air Force One and That Thing You Do. He also did a Christmas Miracle special for ABC. But what he's really here to do, both on our program and in our city, at our college, is to talk about his film, Journey to a Hate-Free Millennium. And it's won all kinds of awards, both here and other parts of, of the world. He is 
spoken in 47 states and in 10 countries, and he has a very, very powerful message. And Brent, it's great to have you back. You're just you. such a great interviewee. Thank and you very much. your message is very powerful. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. And Erna Reinhardt, it's great to have you back as a panelist. But before we get into questions with our wonderful guest, we're going to pause for about four and a half minutes and show a segment that Mr. Scarpo has given us about his film. And upon the end of that, we will continue to uh, question our guest. We'll do that at this time. was chosen at random because he was a black man. The attack on Matthew Shepard has crystallized our anger, has crystallized our pain, has crystallized our suffering. Does the whole nation believe there's only one side to this debate? And it just hit me why I am so devastated by it is because this is what I was trying to stop. Never! something like this happen again in the future of this country. Matt would be the very first to say that he was not a perfect child. He made mistakes, but those mistakes hurt no one but himself. Matt experienced many disappointments and many successes. All of these experiences opened his eyes and heart even more to the differences in people. He knew judging people before knowing them was a waste of an opportunity. He never understood why everyone didn't think that way. He felt there could be nothing better on this earth than another friend. It really, really had a huge impact, not just on me, but I'm sure anyone who read that story it had the most devastating effect. I felt such pangs of um, anger um, and, and sorrow. He was not a perfect child. He had all his problems like everyone else did, going to school. And many times the assistant principal would have called his name out, James Bird, come to my office right away. So he was not a perfect child. But at the same time, you know, he, what he was good at, he was very good at, very talented. My brother never took piano lessons. He played everything by ear. And he just got up one day and started playing it, and he'd been playing it and just pick up things. He'd just hear a song and start playing it. And that's the talent, that's the gift that he had. Well, at Columbine, of course, one of the things that was so dramatic was because they were so young, you know? And you wonder where does a 17-year-old mind come up with this plan? And where, where, does, that, where, where does that start? She was known as the girl with a funny hat in school. And she was so comfortable with her physical beauty that she didn't need to flaunt it. And, and she would purposefully wear odd clothes and uh, everything from Dr. Seuss type hats to uh, plastic hats. Just she enjoyed being different. And uh, so, you know, I have to admit, I, you know, I struggled with earrings and noses and tongues and things like that. And, uh, and she would just talk to me about, Dad, you know, you don't have to agree, and you don't even have to like it, but just come to know the people. I believe one thing, you believe another. Doesn't mean I'm wrong, it just means each of us has the right to choose. Don't let anything get in the way of love. You can have more love in the world by loving your sisters and brothers.
Now you have seen uh, about four and a half minutes from this very, very powerful film, and it's very emotional, and I'm sure you agree. And with that, we will turn to our panelist, Erna Reinhardt, for, to continue the questioning with our guest, Brent Scarpo. Brent, thank you for sharing that with us and with our viewers. That was a very powerful piece and very emotional. Um, t share with us what kind of things, you must have gone through a very personal journey as you did this documentary. Tell us some of the things that you learned from this project. Sure. I mean, putting a documentary, I, someone asked me, what's it like to make a documentary? I said, and I wasn't exactly sure because this was my first documentary. Um, I was a casting director for many years and one of the films that I first cast was a film called The Shawshank Redemption, which that just showed me that when Hollywood wants to be responsible, wow, can it do some amazing things. So, you know, doing this documentary was a really uh, amazing gift, but doing a documentary is like giving birth to a child without a sonogram. You just push and you breathe and you pray for a healthy child, you know, and in the pushing and the breathing, you know, you have all the wonderful people that support you as you give birth to this child. And so we had an amazing team of, you know, cameramen and, and such, and I thought, how can I get them on the same page to understand what it is that we're doing? So before we shot one piece of film, uh, I thought, where can we go to really get it, to understand what it is that we're about to embark on? So uh, I brought everybody to the fence where Matthew had been found. And they didn't know I was taking them. Uh, we just drove from Denver to Wyoming and I was able to get directions on how to get to this place. And as I was just sharing what it is that my philosophies were about this, I just knew that it was gonna be a very emotional journey for us all and that we needed to face our fears and our tears and all that stuff in order to really be able to hear all the different perspectives because there's a lot of different perspectives when it comes to the subject of hate. The perpetrators, the victims, the victims' families, and I need to be able to hear it all without judgment. And so we went there and uh, I just asked everyone to be quiet. And if anyone needed to talk to anybody, just come over to me. And some circled the fence, some touched the fence. You know, it was an amazing moment. And if I hadn't begun it that way, I think we wouldn't have been able to have dealt with all the emotion that happened thereafter. You know, working with Mr. and Mrs. Shepard and, and uh, James Bird Jr.'s family and the students at Columbine, you know, we were able to be professionals and, you know, and really show the whole picture. But at the same time, you know, we could walk away and really get what, what this is all about. Um, we're just as human as everybody else is, but it was important that we really understand the, the depth of this. Because what I did is a documentary on hate. I didn't do a documentary about a gay student. I didn't do a documentary about high school students. I didn't do a documentary about a black man. I did a documentary on hate. And these three people happen to be uh, the victims. Wonderful. On that note, too, and, and having the opportunity to read some of your material ahead of time, which is very helpful. Uh, we all have very personal experiences, and there are a lot of things that lead us down a certain path in life. And uh, would you be kind enough? And, uh, and I don't want to be too be too personal, if you wish, not do so. But I do believe that there were some things that happened that you observed that got you on this path that, that created. I see in you uh, an incredible commitment, uh, intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, with this cause. And so, could you share something that? Um, th I guess there's two stories uh, that I particularly understand. You have a wonderful story about your wonderful mother and, mm -hmm. and, and all the. Uh, you have been doing your research. <laughs> <laughs> that you, Absolutely. You, you, you were a wonderful son and that you helped uh, uh, nurse her and all through this period. And in fact, uh, the New Lot Media is in her honor. I Absolutely. And Absolutely. Then, then also maybe a funeral or, or another episode. If you'd just share with sure. us, because I think that's really helpful to our viewers. And you have this wonderful one thing too how one person can make a great difference. So on my show here, I like to try to inspire people to do things like you're doing. Sure. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, it is about really causing those ripples. And um, it's interesting. I look at um, tragedies occur. You know, God knows we've had a lot of tragedies recently. We've had 9-11. We've had the war. And we're all really coming together to try to figure out how has our world changed. More importantly, I think the second question that a lot of us fail to ask of ourselves is, what is it that I need to do to make the difference in that world? So that what? So that these don't happen again. Because I think historically, when you th thing, see things happen again and again and again, it's because we haven't learned the lesson, and we just go back to school. You know, I don't want another 9-11. I don't want to have another war. And what is it that we need to learn? Well, that's how I kind of view tragedies. Um, and I think tragedies allow us the ability not only to grieve, but also to learn. And if we don't learn, we're destined to repeat the same errors. You know, whatever those might be, personally, professionally, uh, whatever. And um, when... Uh, 
when the documentary really came about, um, you know, there was there was a lot of things that occurred. There, w- I was in Hollywood when there was a huge, huge vigil for Matthew Shepard, and we really hadn't, or we weren't convinced that the second story was Matthew Shepard. We knew James Burr Jr., but even you know, as that was unfolding in the news, we still we just waited a little bit. It was like, well, I'm, you know, we need to feel it, you know, because yeah. that's how we do it. We do. My mother used to say. Um, her children were either heart children or head children. You know, I was the heart child. And she'd always say, but don't forget, you know, if you start with the heart, don't forget to take the elevator to your mind. Oh, oh beautiful way of saying it. You know, and oh. vice versa. My sister yeah. is the head child. Right. And whenever she, my sister was all freaked about it, she was like, well, that's fine. You're in your head. Now take the elevator down to your heart. And the answers will be there. So um, in Hollywood, there was a huge vigil for Matthew Shepard. And uh, it, it became very spontaneous. And 25,000 people or so showed up. And uh, it's when we were... I mean, 25,000 people. I think it's the largest we'd ever seen. And we had our candles. I was with the other producer and director. And what I found interesting is that we were all walking down the street. Um, I'm a great observer of people. As a casting director, you have to look at people's pictures and hire them. Well, I can look at people's eyes and see their souls. Don't cover your eyes. Uh, I'm good at it. And I looked at the crowd, and I saw some interesting things. I saw people had been holding candles for years. For every human rights issue, for every horrible thing that happened, you could tell the old timers that it always, they had, they had their own personal candle, <laughs> right? But what it astounded me was the numerous amount of people that had never held a candle in their life. And for whatever reason, that story compelled them to get off their couch, to get out of their house. And, and as I looked at their eyes, I could see that they weren't really clear why they were there, but they knew their heart told them that they had to be. And I had never seen so many of those kinds of faces. And uh, that's when I whispered to the producer, I think the second story is about Matthew. And we both looked at each other, and it was at that moment in time that we knew that that was the case. Um, That was a huge moment. That moment only came because, you know, I believe one person can change the world change the world. Uh, in fact, we have a new website called powerofone1.org and last year we actually put a thing together to where we basically we were able to, my nonprofit group to get uh, about $1,000 and we just think people need to, to take action. You know, it's the action and those ripples that we need to do. So, you know, we got 38 ideas and we just awarded $1,000 to the best idea recently. Um, well, that really came out of uh, um, taking time out for myself. I was a casting director for many years. I love what I did, but you know, casting the next child in the next Cheetos commercial wasn't really helping the world uh, as much as I adored it. Um, it was during that time that, unfortunately, my mother got diagnosed with lung cancer, and uh, she was a single mom that raised three kids by herself. And you know, we're a very optimistic family, and we were going to, you know, we were going to beat this. And I became a primary caregiver, and. Uh, and at the end, she had cancer for about a year, and it metastasized to her brain, unfortunately, and that's when the neurologist said, there's nothing else we can do. You know, that's what you don't want to hear. And we, my family, was about to endure a tragedy. We were about to lose our mother. And, um, you know, I went through all the pain and the suffering and the grieving and, you know, tried to figure out what this was all about, and I even shared this with Karen in the car. Uh, we put my mother in hospice. And what I chose to do is this, because we were going to put her in a nursing home, and I just knew the power of what this moment could do. It could either make or break us, and I wasn't going to allow it to break us, and I wasn't going to allow it to break me. And I thought to myself, what am I going to learn? And we put her in hospice, and my sisters and mothers really wanted to put her in a nursing home, but there was a lot of fear there, and I knew that they would regret that decision. And so to try to convince them in some shape or form why this needed to happen, because they would learn from this tragedy, I sat them down and I said, I sort of had this epiphany, this aha moment the night before. And I said, you know, mom is our only parent. And I said, we know she's about to die. Um, she's never died before. This will be her first time. And who are we to put her in a nursing home for something that she's never done before? And wouldn't it be better if we just surround her with as much unconditional love as possible? And so what I did is I got as many volunteers as I possibly could to, for the next two and a half weeks, to make sure that one person was holding her hand. And that we would learn that I chose to make my mother's death the greatest experience of my life. 
Well, that takes a lot of volunteers. It takes a lot of help. And each one of us did our thing. Well, I was sort of the administrator. And I called friends and family members and such and said, you know, can you help? Can you do this day? And this one particular friend I called and I asked if she could come on this particular Saturday to watch because uh, we all had lives and we were doing our thing. And um, she said, I can't. And I said, oh, okay. I said, well, what about Saturday night? She said, well, I can't do it then either. I said, oh, okay. I said, that's right, you don't have a car. I said, what about Sunday morning? And as I said that, she screamed over the phone, Brent, I can't! And this woman had known my mother for years. She had been at my mother's birthday parties and laughed with her and had cake with her. And I pulled the phone from her, uh, from me, and I, I said, okay. And I wrote my journal that night. Why is it that when we find the greatest truth about somebody, that we ostracize them, or we fear them, mm -hmm. or, we, or we let them go. The fact of the matter is this woman couldn't be in the same room with my mother, even though she had known her for 20 some odd years. And you know, I hadn't learned about ignorance and fear and anger yet. Was I angry? Oh, you bet. Was there ignorance? Absolutely, she had some. Was there fear? Oh, it was rampant. Mm -hmm. And I discovered, it was interesting, people that didn't know my mother at all would show up and love her unconditionally. And then there were those that had known her for years and just couldn't be in the same room. And I thought, why do we, once we find the greatest truth about the people that we love, you know, act differently? Why do we, why do we treat them differently? If you don't mind my saying so, I think there's a, that's so powerful. There's another story here that I'll make that connection immediately, and that is, in, in dealing with hate and prejudice too, people have great fear for differences oh, sure. too, and uh, the unknown. Absolutely. And one other quick note and go back to Erna. I'm glad you helped with the hospice. There were 17 of us started hospice in North Idaho years ago. It is the greatest it's, gift it's in the world. Gift. It is the greatest gift in the world. And a decade on that board and it's present by the time I saw how quite much it meant to individuals to be home around their surroundings and family as they die and also financially not to burden the family to the extent I mean, it's everything about it is right. creates a different situation. Well, even with you know, even with these three tragedies in my film, I mean, you know, it's very different. I mean, Matthew's parents and such they were, they describe it. They were able to be around him when he was right. when he died. You know, unlike James Bird Jr., they, right. they a sheriff shed. We might have somebody that looks like, but yeah. they couldn't even identify right. him. And then, unfortunately, with the Columbine, those poor parents had to wait, you know, a couple of days before they could even go in to see which students had been shot. You know, and as, as Rachel Scott's father said, you know, I had two students at Columbine, and by six o'clock we hadn't heard from Rachel. Mm -hmm. You know, and they didn't even, they couldn't even know until the next day. Yes. Okay. So it's, you know, it's those different scenarios of how we mm -hmm. deal with tragedy, and each one of them actually have dealt with the tragedy and have, have chosen to educate the world. Mm -hmm. Well, my, my thing is, well, if they've gone through that and they can do it, who are we who have not done, gone through such, you know, tragedy to at least be able to speak out and, and educate people, if not from a personal perspective, but from just a perspective? Thank you. All right. Wow. Um, just a second, I'm thinking. The power of one is what I want to ask uh, you about. Um, and I think so often we don't feel like we have very much power, but as educators, our jobs, I think, is to try to empower people and make them feel like they can make a difference. But, uh, but what I don't know and what I want you to explain to us is what is the power of one? Is that a separate nonprofit or is that yeah. a program what that you that? have? Or what is it? When I was speaking to college students and such, I really felt the energy from these students that they really did want to make a difference. And primarily the reason why they didn't is because no one gave them the opportunity no one would listen, or there was so much red tape in the world that they just thought, oh, I'm sick, I just can't do it. Because everyone would come up to me afterwards like, what can I do? Mm -hmm. How can I help? Mm -hmm. What can I, you know? They wanted to. You know, I'm like, well, this is a university. You've been here for four years. Why haven't you done this? Why did it take me to give you permission? Because nobody in their lives had given them permission. So I decided to put this thing called the Power of One. It's powerofnumberone.org. I thought, let's just figure out some way to, give, to make a difference. It's our actions in the ripples that are going to create a loving world. So we just did this very simple web page where I said, what would you do with $1,000 if I gave it to you? And the only thing you had to do with it is create something that made a positive difference in the world. And so that's what we did from a New Light Media point of view. And so over that year, I got about 38 applications. They just went on the, on the website. I said, I don't want five, six, seven, eight paragraphs. I don't want to correct it. I just want two, three paragraphs. You know, Tell me what would you do with 1000 bucks?" And we gave them ideas. Maybe you'll take all the women at the battered women's shelter to dinner. Maybe you'll just go to the Boys and Girls Club and you'll hire a basketball coach because they've run out of money just to teach basketball for the day. Maybe you'll go into Kmart and you'll buy so many crayons and pieces of paper that you can give it to that kindergarten class because that school's run out of money for supplies. 
It doesn't have to be a week long, awesome. a year long. It can just be a, a random act of kindness. Mm -hmm. And so we got 38 applications, and uh, we picked out one a couple of weeks or so ago. And you know, it's our way of being able to make a difference. Um, what was interesting is that I thought I only got 38. Why didn't I get more? And I realized, oh, you know what? The stakes aren't high enough. And so we are in the process. And uh, you know, if anybody hears my voice and they have ideas, we'd love for you to share them with our organization. Um, we're doing it again. This time we're doing like a scholarship grant program for high schools and for colleges. And I'm, I'm, I'm tearing, taking the world by storm. Um, we want to have them create actions. They just aren't going to write about it. We're going to have a scholarship program to help for the, their education, and all they have to do is do something, and then they have to prove to us that they did it in their community that was positive, either through a, a movie, uh, letters of witness, uh, photographs. And then, create, then they apply for the, uh, the uh, scholarship. And then I know that something positive has been done. They can, I don't want their grades. I don't want their SAT scores. I'm not worried about any of that stuff. There's enough stuff. So, um, and then we're going to pick out the top four for high schools and the top four for colleges. And I'm working with corporations now to, to say, look, our young people want to do something. Will you empower them? If we can act as a liaison to get this out to them, you know, uh, will you help us? So for high, sc for, uh, high schools, we're in negotiations right now with, um, we want to have like four basic gifts. We want to work with com a couple computer companies to get them a computer and the software so when they go to college, they have that. Um, we're working with a couple airlines so that as, when they become freshmen in college, they can get a round trip ticket home. You know, to experience that. Um, we want to do a $10,000 scholarship to any school of their choice. And then the one thing I've got confirmed, which I'm so excited, and I'll talk about it tonight, um, I went to a very private school called Mercier's College in Erie, Pennsylvania. And it's a very unique story because I didn't want to go to college. Um, thank God I did because uh, they just confirmed uh, about a month ago that the, the first gift that we're going to give to the top idea for a high school student going to college is they've donated a $100,000 four-year college education free of charge. Wow. So for my college students, we're going to do the same thing, the computer, we want to do uh, a car, because college students got to have a car, uh, we want to do the round trip <laughs> ticket, and then we want to do like a $20,000 scholarship to continue their education. Because okay. I know when I was in college, so many times my mother would call me as a single parent and said, I don't think you're going to be able to go back next year. Or as we know so well, so many colleges and universities, all their funding is being cut, and all of a sudden it just trickles down. And you know, I, what makes me ill? <laughs> is that you might have this wonderful administrator, teacher, professor who's doing some amazing work and just because of money, which I just don't find that a viable excuse, I'm sorry, is going to be let go. And I see the ripple effects. Or we let go of this one student because he can't afford, she can't afford. You know, it's like Rachel Scott's father said one time when I spoke with him, and he used to be a preacher, uh, powerful. He said, you know, my, my daughter was murdered, and I know that to be true. But what if... She was the one that was supposed to find the cure to AIDS. Mm. It's gone. And we'll never know. It's so hard to ask questions after that. Uh, <laughs> but I gave a, a speech as president of the Northwest Coalition because much harassment every year the president gave an annual speech. And so I, one year I chose to give a speech, the, the Sins of Prejudice and Bigotry, and because we've had so much of it, so many people didn't get to accomplish what they wanted to in life. Women could not run for office. And how many great uh, uh, women we lost that, that could help solve problems are when African Americans could not be educated as a family to educate them. And so we are a poorer society because that we set up roadblocks on that journey down the road where they could not even participate. Uh, I'd like to get your reaction to that of, of what have we caused society through our prejudice and bigotry? Uh, life in and of itself. I mean, pure life. I mean, isn't it interesting? Will we ever really know what it is that we... Uh, that's the sad part. The, it, it is the mystery and the unknown of our own ignorance, of our own fear, and of our own anger. And typically it's all because of, you know, control. You know, it's like this one particular group. We've, we'll never know, but I know it's insurmountable. Um, you know, uh, like Rachel Scott, uh, as he said so wisely, I mean, what was... Matthew Shepard wanted to be a diplomat. That was his goal in life. Yeah, we'll never know. Right, we'll never know. You know, what about, what about you know, the 12 kids at Columbine? What were they supposed to do to graduate? What, what miracles would they have occurred? You know, it's interesting, and it's twofold. You look at 9-11, you know, and w people ask me, was I going to do a documentary about 9-11? I said, I don't think so. I'm pr pretty busy. But if I was to do a documentary on 9-11, this is what I would do. And it's sort of the antithesis to what we're talking about now. I would, because I had a friend whose father uh, had a meeting in one of the towers, is that was at the bottom floor when his cell phone goes off and they said, are you here? He said, yeah. He said, look, we're about a half hour late, go down to the deli, 
come back in a half hour. He leaves. As soon as he walks out the door, the plane hits. His life is spared. I would love to do a documentary on one, all those kinds of people, and I want to follow them for the next 20 to 30 years, and what are they supposed to do? And how does that change their life? Absolutely. They from it? Absolutely. And do they change? Do they see what it is that happened in their lives? And what the, is that some little higher power saying, you know what, you're supposed to be doing something here, and this is what happened. I would love to follow those people for about 30 years, those, those, those just near misses. Uh, there, there are the stories where one person was late picking up a child, something was not in the building. Um, all of that becomes uh, almost mystical in uh, mm -hmm. nature. Brian, on that note, I have to bring the program to conclusion. What a delight to have you here. Uh, we are a better people because you came. Well, thank you. Uh, I know our viewers have been inspired, and I, I just am such an optimistic person. I know there's some people out there that this will change them, and they will do things they would not have done. Well, thank you very much. And that's the purpose of a program. Well, it was a pleasure. And, uh, it was thank a you pleasure. for sharing your, your wonderful thoughts with us and gracing us with your presence. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, with that we bring to a conclusion a 14-week series. It's been a very, very meaningful one for us and at times uh, very emotional and at times draining because we know that it's not the subject that um, has such things as humor, and, but it was very essential that we do that. And we're very grateful to the University of Idaho, Office of Diversity and Human Rights, and the Greg Carr Center uh, of Human Rights at Harvard for helping us. Until next week, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station.